Kelly. This is uh, Michael Saab with Innovative Rx Strategies. And <clears throat> Greg and I, when we talked to UCS about doing this conference, um, we wanted to do this because we understand that there's been a lot of media coverage lately about the um, hyperinflationary costs of certain drugs. And I think probably the most recent example, of course, is you know Myelin's EpiPen and, and what has happened with that. And also with our own clients who I'm sure, like you, have, have really been frustrated with budgeting, you know, for the cost of uh, their prescription drug benefits because of the increase in, in drug spend that they're experiencing because of the increase in costs in, in certain prescription drugs. So we thought that it would be a timely topic to talk about, you know, what is really going on in the marketplace right now with respect to the inflation of certain prescription drugs, and really, more importantly, what, what can you do as a buyer of prescription drug benefits to uh, look at lowering those costs or trying to protect yourself against those, those inflationary drug costs as you may be experiencing. On the first page that we'll go to here, we'll, it's we'll entitled, you know, Sticker Shock. This kind of gives you somewhat of an, an overview of really what has happened in the marketplace really in the last, you know, two years in terms of uh, the increase in prescription drug spending that, that uh, employers and health plans have been experiencing because of, of the increase in uh, AWPs or wholesale acquisition costs of, of, of certain drugs. And this trend is going to continue. I think that um, from what we're reading and what we're seeing in the marketplace, I think that uh, uh, it's expected that uh, prescription drug pricing will continue to increase by about an average of between 7 and 8% over the next, you know, two years, uh, on top of the, you know, the 12% increases which have occurred in 2014 and 2015 and also occurring, you know, this year as well. Um, right now, across the, the country, about, you know, $425 billion is spent in overall prescription drug uh, or drug costs, which accounts for about 17% of, of the spend in this country for, for health care, which is, which is quite a bit. And, and the reality is, is that prescription drug pricing is, is increasing higher than the cost of uh, inflation on an annual annualized basis. So the question is, is why is that happening? And we're going to talk a little bit about that today to kind of give a little more background uh, to you as to what is actually occurring in the market. Um, it is estimated that uh, one in six people are not taking their prescription drugs uh, because of the, the cost of those particular drugs, and part of that will be is, is maybe attributable to the use of high deductible health plans, which Greg will address. Uh, there's one report that we read yesterday that came out from one of the, the larger PBMs that said that, uh, that based upon their research that the number of people that are actually not taking drugs because of, of price is one in three. So that, which seems a little high, but, but again, it kind of gives you an idea about these, these price in, increases and how they could impact uh, your, your members in terms of their ability to take a prescription. And if they're not taking their prescription drugs, as we know, that's going to have an impact on your medical side costs as well. So it's really important to get a handle on what you can do to make sure that, that you know, you're, you're, you're countering these increases in, in, in uh, prescription drug costs uh, to help you lower your medical side costs as well. A lot of these drugs, and again, you know, I mean, most of you have probably read about uh, uh, you know, Martin Screlly, the, the farm bro, as this has been referred to in the press, about there, there have been hedge funds out there that actually have, they're not really pharmaceutical companies, but they have bought drugs because they saw the, you know, the, the value of, of buying certain prescription drugs on the market that were maybe old generics that they bought. And, you know, for example, Turing Pharmaceuticals bought a drug um, that was called Daraprim, uh, which was used for, you know, the treatment of, uh, you know, uh, toxoplasmosis for, for in newborns and also for patients who had HIV AIDS. And, and Turing and Martin Screlly increased the, the price of, of uh, Daraprim overnight by 5,000% from $13.50 a pill to $750 a pill. And the same thing with Valiant Pharmaceuticals who bought a drug called Glumetta uh, and increased the, the price of that drug by 800%. So, that's, that's one of the things that's occurring in the marketplace are people trying to find drugs that have not been, you may not be, have been used a lot or used for certain, you know, conditions that they see an opportunity to, um, you know, buy those drugs and, and you know, from the, from the, 
from a generic manufacturer, from the manufacturer, then increasing uh, those drug costs to try to make up make a lot of money. So. Um, we're going to ask the, the first question. We have a, a couple questions we want to ask, and, and this really kind of deals with your own experiences about whether or not you have seen an increase in your prescription drug spend or if you've experienced this inflationary impact of, uh, of the drug costs. So we're going to uh, put a um, slide up here to kind of see how you, what you're experiencing in, um, in the market. Yeah, this is Greg Madsen. So one thing that we've seen for a lot of our clients is that their costs of their specialty drugs have gone up pretty significantly. Right? That's kind of the, the driving force that patients on our members that are on hepatitis C, as well as the rheumatoid arthritis drugs, right? Those the increased use of those drugs has really increased a lot of people's um, drug spend. It, it keeps going up, so it's pretty interesting to kind of see how everyone's doing there. And it looks like a lot of people are running in that 10 to 15 percent range, which which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, which is consistent with the the 12 percent growth that, that we've been seeing and that clients have been experiencing. So okay, okay. so we can close that, Kelly. Thanks. So one of the other um, issues, though, that's kind of driving a lot of these higher costs is something called Evergreen, right? So that, and what this really is, is when, when drug manufacturers create a, a brand drug, a new drug that they bring to market, the, the Food and Drug, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, gives them really a 20-year patent protection on that drug. And a lot of times it takes them, you know, 12, 15 years to actually get the drug to market. And so they have, you know, seven to, you know, five to seven years to actually recoup their money for it. And once that patent is up, then generics start becoming available for it. And that's one of the challenges, though, is that once they get close to the expiration of their patents, drug manufacturers will start kind of reformulating these drugs. They'll kind of do a redesign of them, make them slightly different, um, so that they're not quite exactly the same, but they're very similar to it. You know, historically this has happened with drugs like, for example, Mevacor, which was a cholesterol-lowering drug, Merck created Zocor, which was a very similar drug to Mevacor that they brought out. Prilosec, when it first came on the market for um, heartburn and stuff, right, when it started approaching its expiration, all of a sudden AstraZeneca had Nexium on the market, right? So there's, they do these kind of things to try to extend the patent. You know, they create a slightly different drug and can kind of come up. So that's kind of what's considered this kind of evergreening which continues then to bring these new drugs to market with kind of marginal cost difference. You know, at the bottom I talk a little bit about Ambien. You know, the, when Ambien was about ready to go generic on this thing, the manufacturer of that created a controlled release, a CR, extended release form of the drug, which had really no clinical significance, you know, they, for the value of the whole piece, but it allowed them to, you know, create a new drug and get a new patent on that and kind of extend it. And that's just kind of these examples of evergreening, which tends to continue to keep those brands alive and, um, and extending costs. Yeah, I think and it, <clears throat> the evergreening is, is an issue that has been, of course, been brought up in the, this political season about, you know, whether or not the uh, FDA should allow for more competition with brand drugs by allowing more generics into the market by kind of dialing back the amount of time that a, a brand manufacturer should have um, regarding its patent protection. So I, I think that this is probably something, you know, the, the, the new uh, administration and, and Congress will have to deal with because, um, again, with, with the Myelipan or the, the EpiPen from Myelin and some of these other drugs, uh, it really does beg the question about how long should a, a drug manufacturer have the ability to extend its patent um, if, the, if, if competition in the marketplace will help lower costs, then there, there has to be a balance between those two, which I think will be something that will be discussed uh, you know, going forward after the election. Um, the next thing, we're, we're going to talk about three different, the, the, the three main areas you know, where, where people are experiencing um, increases in, in their drug costs because of an inflationary, on an inflationary basis. And that's really on brand drugs, it's generic drugs, and, and specialty. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about here a little bit is on, on brand drug in, in inflation. Um, and brand drugs comprise uh, about 10% of all prescriptions that are dispensed, but they account for about 72% of the total overall drug spending. Now that could include, you know, especially as well, and that will go up, and Greg will mention, we'll talk about that a little bit. But if you think about it, 10% of all prescriptions dispensed are, are brand drugs. 
that accounts for 72% of, of uh, the drug spending in this country. Um, and as, as I point out one of the, in the second bullet point here, you know, brand drugs are, are averaging about 20%, one out of five brand drugs are experiencing an annual price increase of greater than 20%, which is, you know, as much as, you know, we try to uh, take that into account for clients, sometimes it's hard to know which brand drugs are going to go up, which makes, uh, you know, trying to plan a budget to, or budget for your prescription drug, uh, drug, pot, drug costs a, a nightmare. Um, there's an example of, of, of a drug that just came out and was actually in the press in the last couple of weeks was a drug uh, that was purchased by a company called Novum Forma, which is, which is a brand drug, and they bought the rights to the brand drug Aliquin, um, which sold for about $242.50 prior to May, 5th, May of 2015 for this, this tube of uh, cream. But they bought the drug, and they increased it by 3,900%. Um, and the cream basically contains two very, very inexpensive active ingredients, uh, a decades-old antibiotic called uh, I iotoquinol, is that you pronounce it right? Yeah. And which you can purchase for, you know, a fraction of the cost of, of the, 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 the tube of medication itself, as well as an extract from the aloe vera plant. Um, and so the, the part of this is, is, is that, you know, it, it's really looking at what other alternatives are there on these, some of these brand drugs that have these really high price increases and really looking at it from a formulary standpoint to the say, is there something else out there that, that I should look at uh, my, having my members take and show you put some kind of benefit plan design in, in effect that you know, says you've got to look at other things other than taking these very expensive, these other expensive drugs. The other interesting uh, dialogue that's been taking place, particularly between the pharmaceutical manufacturers and the PBMs, which are who are the middlemen as well as the health plans, is really, you know, who is really getting the benefit of these, these big price increases? Um, and, and the question is, is you know, is, is pharma increasing the brand drug AWPs to pay higher market share and formula rebates uh, to make sure that the PBM includes them on their, their formulary? Um, because it's interesting when you read the articles in the press and also what the Myelin CEO said in front of Congress, her argument was, well, our net cost, which is what they make, has not gone up. Uh, and that their profit has basically remained neutral when it comes to, these, to some of these high-cost you know, brand drugs. So what, what they're trying to say is, look, it's, you know, we have to pay the PBMs more money for, for rebates and I think the, the question is, is really, what is your PVM? How are the PVMs, you know, are, are, are you getting those dollars in the form of those rebate dollars back from your PVM based upon how your, your rebates are defined in the contract? I mean, even if you're getting 100% pass-through of rebates, what are you actually getting? Because I think that, you know, part of it is you have to look at this is, is if you look at the profitability of the PVMs and what they've been reporting to the street over the last several quarters, they're, they're making a lot of money. And, and, it's, and they're making it more than just off the cost, you know, selling on, the, you know, the cost of the drug. There's also this rebate aspect that they're getting as well as the administrative fees and some of the other fees that they're keeping. So it's really important to, to make sure you understand, you know, what you are getting back from your PBM in terms of the rebate, particularly if the, pharma com if the pharmaceutical companies are correct and their, their profit margins are actually neutral, then, then somebody is, is making this money uh, on these brand drugs. I think the other key thing is, is in uh, something we've been, you know, talking about and, and something that has been kind of uh, in, in coming about in the last couple of years is really these AWP price protection provisions that, uh, you know, that pharma has offered or that, that PBMs have negotiated with pharmaceutical uh, manufacturers. Um, and, and I think it's really important to, to make sure that, that depending upon who your PBM is or even if it's your a health plan that has a contract with a PBM, do I have AWP price protection provisions in my contract, which says, hey, look, if, my, if this drug goes up above a particular uh, percent, then I get whatever the, that additional increase is back in the form of a rebate. And one thing I would, would caution you is, is that, again, I think that depending upon the PBMs, the, who the PBM is, is, is really some PBMs just want to pay like a flat dollar maybe initially for AWP price inflection. I, I would recommend that you don't fall for that because if, if, if they have your data, they can, they can pretty well estimate what they think the brand inflation would be on, on your spend 
and you want to be able to take the full value of the, that, those AWP price protection inflation provisions to make sure you're getting uh, what you should be receiving. So another thing to think about is, is as these brands start to come towards their patent expirations and stuff, right, the brand manufacturers may think about releasing what's considered an authorized generic into the marketplace. You know, Myland, when they were talking in front of Congress, really just sent a ripple through the PBM industry when they announced that they were going to release an authorized generic for EpiPen at $300, right? And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what's going on there. Because in a lot of cases, when, when you get an authorized generic, it's really the brand manufacturer's product that they simply put out in the marketplace as a generic drug. You know, when, if you mostly recall, right, when Lipitor came off patent and went generic, there was exclusivity for it. Only one manufacturer could do Lipitor. So there was a, what was considered a single source generic for that. But Pfizer also put a generic Lipitor out in the marketplace, and that was considered an authorized generic. So that whole aspect of it is kind of interesting because when you think about these authorized generics coming out in the marketplace, you know, typically they're, um, you know, they're tr the PDMs try to exclude these authorized generics from their overall generic discounts, right? And so they end up being treated as brands from a discount perspective as opposed to a generic. You know, because a lot of times they'll have in their contract that, you know, for it to be part of the MAC program or be part of their generic guarantees, that it's got to be available from two or more generic manufacturers. Well, if the brand is manufacturer is putting its own brand product in a bottle and, and labeling it generically, it doesn't qualify for that. So you've got to be very careful about um, how the, your contract with your PBMs and how those things are being treated. You know, and typically these authorized generics, right, they, like I said, they end up being treated as a brand and, and kind of um, discounted as a brand as opposed to discounting them as a non-MAC generic, which is really what they should be, and, and, but sometimes that discount is the same as the brands as well. Um, but the, the challenge, though, is that the pharmaceutical manufacturers, if they do offer an authorized generic, they don't pay rebates on them, right? So you think about that was what the ripple effect, I think, that went through the PBM industry. As more and more of these drug manufacturers, these brand drug manufacturers, they start to see their patents coming close to being expiring, if they release a generic or an authorized generic in the marketplace, they no longer have to pay rebates on it. They no longer have to pay you know, the administrative fees for that the PBMs collect on those rebates. Right? There, there's all kinds of value that gets taken out of the market when these authorized generics get put into the, into the system. And from a payer's perspective, from the employer's perspective, the cost may actually be the same or less for them. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So on, on this next slide, we talk a little bit about Myelin and EpiPen, right? So Myelin increased the price of EpiPen year over year. So it went up 550% over the last eight years, right? And there was this huge public outcry for this whole thing. Um, you know, and, and they're saying it's gone up, you know, 20 times since 2007. So it's gone up a lot, right? And so, and Myelin was getting blamed for this stuff, this huge, you know, the pharmaceutical supply chain is raising prices and putting things up, up in the thing. And Myelin's saying, oh, wait a minute, you know, these, EpiPens cost about $608, you know, for a, for a two-pack carton of these things, and that their profit margin on is, is $274, right? That's kind of what they're saying, that that's what they receive on these deals for those two-packs. You know, but then it went down to $150. It just depends on what kind of the margins that they were talking about. But that remaining $334 went to somebody, right? It either went to the PBMs, it went to the insurance companies, the health plans, um, it went to the wholesalers, the retail pharmacies, you know, where, where did that additional cost actually flow through? But then Mylan said, you know what, I'm going to put an authorized generic for this EpiPen out on the marketplace for $300. It'll sell directly to the customers, um, or I'll make that available to the, to the PBMs, right, that they can put on there and, and they can distribute and, and, and price those things out. So it's just really important to think about that what the authorized generics do with regard to the discounts, right? How you, those are going to get treated in your overall discounts, but they could actually be saving you a considerable amount of money. Now, we've got a little slide here that kind of helps take you through the math on this whole piece. So, for example, all right, if EpiPen had an average wholesale price, AWP, of $608, and you were getting a brand discount of that of AWP minus 16%, which is fairly typical for a lot of people, right? The, the gross cost of the employer is a little over $510, $510.72. If your members all have a brand copay of $25 and you're getting a rebate on your brands of $50, right, then 
and you subtract that $75 off of that gross cost and you come up with $435, right? That would be the, the net cost to you, the employer, if they get EpiPen. But if, for example, though, they get the authorized generic for EpiPen, the epinephrine, which is essentially the same product, right, just marketed as the generic instead of having the brand name on it, for $300, if you're getting a non kind of MAC discount, so it doesn't qualify to be on the PDM's MAC list, so they're going to give you a non MAC discount of that of say minus 20%, the gross cost of the employer then is only $240. If the member pays their generic copay of $10, but there's no rebate on it, right, because it's a generic, there's no rebate, still though the net cost of the employer is only $230. There's a, over a $200 difference cost wise to the employer savings by that authorized generic coming into the marketplace. Now you got to think about the challenge though is that my only saying their profit margin is roughly the same whether or not they do the brand EpiPen or the authorized generic coming through. So that's something to start to think about. You know, how can that actually be the case? And for those of you that have you know high deductible health plans, right, you got to think about the member is actually paying that full 51072. That's what they would pay the pharmacy for this product. Um, and in some cases, the PBM may keep all of the rebate. Right? They may not distribute a rebate to you, the employer, in those cases and coming through. So what's that do from a high deductible health plan perspective? The member meets their deductible faster, right? Because they're paying a higher cost for the drugs, and they also get to their maximum amount of pocket sooner because they're, they're paying a higher cost for these drugs as opposed to being paying the cost of these authorized generics. So we have a question here that, um, Kelly, could you bring up the second question with regard to high deductible health plans? So the, the question really is, you know, do you, do you offer your members a high deductible health plan? Is that, is that part of your plan design, you know, and, and what percent of you do? And some people offer it as, as a, you know, one component of your plan design. Some people have it, that's the only plan design they offer, but it's kind of interesting to see. Um, so a pretty high percent, almost 93% of you, thanks Kelly, 93% of you offer some sort of high deductible health plan. So you can think about the structure of this, how this flows through, and, and kind of what the impact then is on, on the overall cost with those high deductible health plans, depending on the strategy that the drug manufacturers take with regard to issuing the brand or putting an authorized generic out there. Now, if you know you do have a high deductible health plan, you know the, the challenge that part of the reason why the members are always complaining about paying the high cost is because even if they're paying the, the cost of it, the five hundred and ten dollars, and the employer's getting the rebate on the back end, right? The member doesn't see the value of that, right? They they see the five hundred and ten. It just it costs them a lot of money to kind of do it. So that's kind of one of the challenges in the high deductible health plan world, and kind of what's going on where the, in an authorized generic. They still get the value of their thing, although the you know you the employer would um, not necessarily get a rebate on it any longer. But still, it would take the member longer to get to their out of pocket maximum and to their deductibles. The next area we're going to talk a little bit about is about generic uh, drug price inflation. We talked a little bit about the the brand drugs and have given an example here with the EpiPen um, and what's going on with that. The next area is the generic drug, um, and I think that a lot of for a long time everybody was promoting generics because they were cheaper. I mean, whether it be the PBM, whether it be the the uh, plan sponsor, everybody was saying we'll take generics because um, they're 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 cheaper and it saves money. And what happened has happened in the last couple of years is that that has kind of been on some generic drugs has been turned on its head, um, and some of the generics have really increased in, in price, which is really uh, cost uh, payers a lot of money, and, and I cited a couple of examples here um, on on this slide about in the last where where generic drugs have gone up an average of about 448 percent, and and probably uh, the one that is is very familiar is is in fact Nightline did a, a, a case study on this was the, the fentanyl citrate, which is the generic for Actique, which is um, a painkiller that that women use for endometriosis. And the cost of that went from $0.50 cents per dose to $37.49 per dose. So if you think about it, if a woman was taking fentanyl citrate, it went from $1.50 a day to, you know, over $100 a day. And so that, that's, a, that's a pretty big increase, and, and particularly if you're on a high deductible health plan or even for a, if you're not and you're the plan and you're paying for these drugs, 
that's a pretty pretty steep you know price increase. And there have been other examples of, of generic drugs that have gone up as well. So, so and a lot of that that's occurring is because there there are some generic drugs are just they're more limited in the supply that's available in the market. And why is that occurring? And a lot of it's occurring because of market consolidation. There used to be like several generic you know manufacturers as, as you know Greg alluded to earlier about to, for a, a generic drug to be included on a, a PBM's MAC list, it had to be made by two or more uh, generic manufacturers or three or, you know, so whatever, depending upon how the PBM defined what, what qualified to be on their MAC list. But, but the reality is, is that a lot of these generic drug manufacturers simply weren't making any money because they had no volume. There was no market share for, for their particular generic drug, and so a lot of them stopped making that drug. They started getting out of the market, so you had fewer and fewer generic drug manufacturers, and so there you, you started seeing um, this consolidation in, in, the, in the marketplace. Um, and, and, and part was is that, um, that once these drugs no longer qualified for the PBM's MAC list, then that increased the client-side cost as well. And, and so that really became important to, to, to uh, you know, make sure that if you had a generic drug, one, what was the definition of a generic drug? And were generic drugs that, that may have been considered to be non-MAC, were they included as a part of your overall generic effective rate or your generic pricing, or were they being priced at, at the, the, the brand rate? Um, and so that, and, and also there became, some generics became in short supply. I mean, there, you may have read that in the newspaper, like there were hospitals or certain drugs that were not available, and, and if you go to the, uh, uh, you know, different websites that are published by CMS, you can, you can, or the FDA, you can see the number of generic drugs that are not available or in short supply, which again has increased, increased pricing pressure on, on certain uh, generic drugs. So the question is, you know, what, do you, what should you do um, to really kind of help mitigate against this impact of these, these uh, increased, uh, increased prices on generic drugs? And part of it is what you really need to do is you need to really kind of monitor your PBM's MAC list and, and ask them for a, a copy of the MAC list, probably no less than a quarterly basis, but preferably on a monthly basis, to really understand, you know, if they're deleting a, a generic drug from the MAC list, why is that occurring? Um, and because what we've seen in, with some PBMs um, is that, that if a generic drug has either increased more than 100% in cost, um, they're trying to exclude these high-cost generic drugs from their generic pricing guarantee. They're just saying, look, we're not going to we're not going to include that as opposed to our overall generic uh, pricing that we're offering the client. And so, you know, we have to dial that that generic rate back. We have to basically charge it a brand rate. So you need to understand for yourself what is your PBM going to do if you have these situations where you have generic drugs that have tried to or had a big price increase because, um, you know, the reality is is that, you know, they don't want to necessarily bear the cost of the, those uh, uh, generic drugs that have increased because of uh, market conditions. Um, again, we try to recommend as, as best you can in your contract to make sure that, that you don't allow the, the PBM to price your non-max generics at a brand discount because there's a big difference between an AWP minus 70, whatever you're getting on your generics versus AWP minus uh, 20 or whatever for a, a non-max generic. So it's, it's better better to make sure that those, uh, uh, any generic or the, is, is included as a part of your, your generic effective rate guarantee. Um, the other thing that's gaining in popularity are really uh, having really two tiers on the generic drugs as well as you know, kind of a preferred, non-preferred generic uh, uh, copay because on even PBMs now are starting to develop preferred and non-preferred generic uh, drug lists because of, um, you know, there's, there could be several different generics in, in, a, in a category that basically have the same, you know, effect and have the same efficacy and uh, as other generic drugs. So the question is, is one less expensive than the other and do you want to try to get, you know, members to take those less costly generic drugs by having a two-tier plan design for generics for preferred and non-preferred uh, based upon a, a copay structure. Um, I think the key thing is, and, and again, I think that uh, something we've been pushing and I think that, you know, we've, we've sort of had some traction in the market and, and we're, we're starting to see PBMs now uh, 
letting clients know when there are these hyperinflationary drugs, whether it be on the brand side or the generic side. But I think that you have to ask your, your PBM, uh, they have to let you know when there are these drugs that are increasing in cost. And normally what we try to do is, if, hey, look, if it's going up 50% or more, you've got to let us know because, um, you know, we, we want to be able to get ahead of this, the, the, the situation to, to see if there are alternatives that we may want to consider um, as opposed to the drug that's going up in cost, whether it be through either, you know, some kind of a step therapy or whatever you want to put into place from a plan design perspective or not covered if there's something else that's even available. Um, and as I said, that you know you can that you can you can see for yourself which uh, which generic drugs are in, in shortage or in short supply if you go to like the FDA or the American Society for Hospital Pharmacy websites. Um, so I think the you know, the key thing is is you know sometimes even if you're when you you have a generic drug that is increased in cost, I mean part of it is is, is you need to have your PBM tell me what are the alternatives in that class for that or that category and class for that particular generic drug. Um, you know, the, for example, um, if, if, if they can give you the information, you can kind of make a decision about what alternatives, for example, we have one here on the cholesterol lowering drug, um, you know, which one is the, 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 the less expensive that you should be using or consider using for your, your members. The other thing to take into consideration is, is, you know, you really need to do the math. I mean, if there's a brand drug that you're getting a rebate on, um, you know, sometimes you need to look at that, whether it makes more sense to cover that brand drug as opposed to maybe even the generic. I know it sounds counterintuitive in terms of what we're saying that a lot of people were promoting generics because it was cheaper, but sometimes you just have to look at it to say, is the brand drug, drug cheaper than the generic that's increased in cost if you factor in, in the rebate? Um, and I think that, you know, the, 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 uh, on terms of like the Martin Screlly example on Daraprim, you know, the question is, is when it's, Daraprim was really a generic that goes back to the 1950s. And the question is, is, you know, if you have a generic drug that somebody all wants increases the cost, you know, 5,500%, you know, does that really make it a specialty drug? And I think that, you know, a lot of PBM contracts don't really address that situation. Does, does Daraprim fall within the definition of a specialty drug when it was a generic before, but now somebody says, well, it was because it's $750 a tablet, it's a specialty drug. Not necessarily. So I think that that's a discussion that you need to have with your PBM about when you have the Daraprim type situations, what are they, how are they going to treat that? Because they're not going to want to treat it as a generic and give you a discount as opposed at, at you know, 70 some off on a generic versus a, a specialty drug. So you've got to, you've got to understand what they're going uh, to do. Um, I think that uh, you, you, part of it you've got to plan ahead, part of it's just having information from your PBM about monitoring the, the price uh, so you can go ahead and plan to, you can mitigate any pricing impact that, that you may be experiencing because of increases in generic drugs. So the, the, the last kind of piece is about the specialty drugs. Right? When you think about what's, what's costing you all the money and then going through, you know, as Michael mentioned, right, but about 72% of the of your costs are really going to be on brand drugs, but 50%, right, out of that 72 is really going to be on specialty drugs. You know, they're going to be half of your overall costs are going to be just on specialty drugs. So the question really is, are, is, is biosimilars, right, is that really the remedy for these high-cost specialty drugs? Can these biosimilars, you know, kind of help come out? And, and really, what is a biosimilar? Can you think about most of these specialty drugs? Now, they're, they're really brewed, they're proteins that are grown as opposed to just chemicals that are manufactured. So they're considered these large molecules, or they're grown and they're proteins that come through. So they're not technically chemically equivalent to the originator drug, so, so they can't really be generically substituted, right? That, that becomes one of the challenges. And, and the state boards of pharmacies within each of the various states has to determine how substitutable a given biosimilar is to its originator brand. So, for example, the state of Arizona, though, um, Nupagen came out, had a, had a biosimilar available to it called Xerxio, and in the state of Arizona, the board said that that is a substitutable generic for Nupagen, but it's just kind of a challenge. You know, there has been this pipeline of stuff that's come out of the different ones. Right now, there's really kind of four that have been put out into the market that are really that are becoming available. So, Nupagen and, and Xerxio that I mentioned, right, that's 
that's one of the pieces coming through. Um, Lantus, which is this kind of long-acting insulin that we'll talk a little bit more about, has a, has a biosimilar available to it in the market called Basilgar. Um, Basilgar. Um, Remicade, right, is coming out with, Pfizer just announced that um, next month they're going to come out with their biosimilar for it called an Inflectra. And then Humira, which Amgen just got approved for its biosimilar on the marketplace, although Abby, the manufacturer of Humira, is going to, you know, is trying to take them to court saying there's still a patent out there on these things and, and can't really come through. So there's really kind of the four biosimilars that have really been approved out in the marketplace. So you got to think about from a plant sponsor perspective, how do you take advantage of these biosimilars? You know, they're, the FDA and stuff, people are going to say there's somewhat of a 15 to, you know, 30 percent lower AWP average wholesale price on these biosimilars, you know, and so is there interchangeability of it? Is it more of a therapeutic interchange where you can, you know, do that as opposed to a, a generic substitution piece to make kind of switch back and forth? Challenge is if you start somebody on a biosimilar and they don't work quite as well, you know, can they get it, can they switch back to it, which I'm, you know, is, is truly the case. But, you know, is, is this just though becoming kind of this new kind of shell game out there where you got PBMs, you know, trying to exclude rebates on biosimilars because the drug manufacturers to try to encourage the use of their biosimilar, right, they're either going to really boost the rebates on them, right, because you, you, all of you have heard of, you know, the, some of the, the drugs that are getting 40, 50 percent discounts off on them or big rebates associated with them that are flowing through on, you know, some of the hepatitis C drugs and stuff. And so how do you get advantage of those kind of things or does the PBM keeping that, um, you know, relative to what's going on on just simply the specialty drugs. That's all things that take into consideration. Let's talk a little bit, though, about the impact of biosimilars on the future drug costs, right? So, you know, if, it, if they are, you know, uh, 15, 30 percent below the cost, there could be, you know, a, a reduction of, of their overall drug spend as, as these biosimilars start to flow through into the marketplace. You know, they, they should account for, you know, some of the savings, and there should be some dollars flowing through as these biosimilars get used. There's also things to think about is a lot of times the manufacturers of these biosimilars are offering coupons, because they're specialty drugs, right? They're offering these big manufactured coupons that have pretty significant value to them that can be used, you know, and, and a lot of the PBMs are starting to put programs together to allow the employers that use that big coupon to cut, to reduce the employer's costs as opposed to giving it to the member to allow the member to reduce their costs. So that's all stuff that you got to think about how your PBM contracts are written and what kind of services you're going to get as those kind of go through. But you know, as these biosimilars start to come to market, right, the, the challenge is going to be, you know, will there be these new blockbuster drugs coming through or will, the, or will they just kind of tweak those drugs just slightly to make them, you know, a, a little bit better drug and so that the biosimilar is not going to really be valuable anymore. That's, that's all kind of challenges. But I think future formularies and benefit designs are even now starting to change to start to take advantage of these biosimilars that are getting provided out and in, out into the marketplace. So you got to think about, you know, so should you really be aligning then with, with your PBM's formulary, right, if they start to cover biosimilars and, and things like that. And so this is really a little bit about the story of Lantus, right, that long-acting insulin that I talked about. But, you know, oftentimes PBMs, right, they'll put a drug on their PDL or their formula or their preferred drug list because of the rebates or, the, you know, the fees that they're able to generate from the drug manufacturers of that. You know, there's, when you think about insulins, right, there's really kind of two major manufacturers of insulin, Eli Lilly, and they make Humulon, Humalog kind of thing, right, those are the big popular, and Novo Nordisk making Novolin and Novolog, the competition between them, right, and, and those of you that are familiar with, you know, like Express Scripts or Caremark, you know that Express Scripts has decided to favor the Humalog, the Eli Lilly products, and Caremark is favoring the Novo Nordisk products, right? That's kind of how that, that works out. But then there's also this, this Lantus that's coming out, which is really this long-acting insulin, which is about, you know, somewhere five, six hundred dollars a prescription. And most, for most of you, my guess is, when you look at your top drugs and, and your cost for it, it's within your top 15 of your most expensive drugs that you have, is this long-acting insulin drug coming through. So, you know, the challenge you start to think about is, is the Lilly and, you know, the, the Humalon, Humalogs, and Novo and Novologs, they've gone up almost double in cost 
since 2011. The AWP, the average wholesale prices of these things, have gone up pretty significantly, and yet the drug manufacturers are saying that their margin has stayed roughly the same, or actually fallen over that time period. So you think, you know, okay, how does that actually happen? How can the average wholesale prices of these things go up twice as high, you know, twice double in, in a few years, and yet your margins stay the same? And I think the big challenge on that thing is that from a lot of times within the, the industry that the AWP, what that really stands for is ain't what's paid. Because that's not what people are actually paying for it. That becomes this list price, kind of like when you're buying a car, right? There's this list price for it. But that's not what you're actually paying for, and that's not what it actually costs you. So where does the rest of this cost difference, right, from, a, from the pharma people go? Well, some of it's in, you know, the discounts, the purchase discounts that they're giving the wholesaler, that they're giving the drug manufacturer, that they're giving the pharmacy chains, right, that are buying it at a discount um, off of their wholesale acquisition cost, and the PBMs, right? The PBMs all have big mail services, and they contract for discounts on those kind of things. But then there's also rebates that get paid based on the utilization of those drugs, the drug manufacturers pay pretty significant rebates. And a lot of times it's those rebates that help determine, you know, whether or not they get placed on the preferred formulary or non-preferred formulary, or whether or not they get excluded altogether from coverage under the formulary. And then the PBMs, though, they also get something called administrative fees. They get an admin fee from the drug manufacturers for managing the rebate programs, right? And sometimes those admin fees can be 4 to 6% of the average wholesale price. So there's clearly advantages to raising that AWP because that's what the rebates are based off of, that's what the admin fees are based off of, but unfortunately that's also what your discounts are based off of based on the way things are contracted with the PBMs. You're getting some sort of discount off of that AWP, so as those go up, your costs continue to rise even though the middlemen, the people in the middle of this thing, are really making a lot of margin. You know, and, and that's why I said mentioned a little bit about why that Mylan's comment about offering an authorized generic for EpiPen sent a real ripple through the PBM industry because they make a lot of money on the rebate side of this thing. And if all of a sudden there's an authorized generic out there that doesn't pay a rebate, and yet and it's lower cost to the employer, and the drug manufacturer makes the same margin, you know, how's that going to impact the profitability of these PBMs? It's going to have a pretty significant change to it. So. But getting back to Lantus, though, so Lantus is long-acting insulin. So let you think about it, it is a specialty drug, or, you know, considered especially, at least, you know, a long-acting insulin product. Um, you know, but some uh, PBNs are starting to say, I'm going to exclude Lantus from my formulary, and I'm only going to cover Lily's brand of the biosimilar called Basilgar, right? So now, all of a sudden, you're, you're starting to see within the excluded formularies for some of the PBMs that some of these specialty drugs are being excluded, Right, and they're only covering either an alternative specialty drug or the biosimilar, because clearly these biosimilars are going to, are going to be like brands, right? Because they're not substitutable. They'll be like a brand coming through, and they're going to cover the, the biosimilar coming through on their formulary. So the challenge starts to be then is really, are you going to receive rebates on those biosimilars, right? Does your contract with the PBM have a clause in it that says, you know, that, that excludes biosimilars from any rebate. Because, you know, you think about it, if, if they are um, not covering one of the, the specialty drugs and only covering the biosimilar, but yet not paying you a rebate on that drug, that's going to have a pretty uh, big financial impact to you potentially. Um, Kelly, can you, um, let's ask the, the, our third question out here with regard to biosimilars. You know, so, we talk about biosimilars being, you know, similar to the to the originator brand on these whole pieces, but um, you know, do any of you have concerns about perhaps requiring your members to use a biosimilar instead of the originator brand name drug? Right? Is, are there concerns out there from you that, gosh, I don't know if I can, if, you know, if it's okay for them to take the biosimilar, or you think that if the FDA has approved it, that, you, that you're comfortable with them um, utilizing it? Wow. Oh, yeah, it's a 50-50 mix on this. So that's, that's interesting, right? So that becomes challenging for those of you that have concerns. If you're with a PDM that's going to require your members to take a biosimilar, if you're aligning with their formulary and, and accepting their exclusions, um, that's going to become a, a pretty big challenge for you. Yeah, what the oh, I adjusted a little bit now. Okay, well, that's good. 
Next, time, next topic we want to talk about a little bit is uh, outcome-based contracting. I think that um, clearly the market is evolving in terms of with the, particularly on the, on the high-cost specialty drugs, about um, if I'm paying $100,000 a year for a drug or $300,000 a year for a specialty drug, um, what, is, what are you, the PBM, going to guarantee or the pharmaceutical manufacturer, what are they willing to to, to uh, pay in terms of an additional discount or whatever if that particular drug doesn't work. Um, again, just because it's, it's you know, on the PBM's formulary and, and you've adopted that particular PBM's formulary, um, you know, should you pay for that drug, you know, simply because it's on their formulary? Um, or should you pay for the drug based upon the patient or, or member outcome? And I, and I think that there's been a real groundswell in the last year or so about this outcome-based contracting, and it kind of has sort of evolved out of the, the health plan side, but I also think it has a lot of applicability to the employer side as well in terms of negotiating with your PBM uh, in terms of, of uh, what you would pay for a particular drug if, in fact, it doesn't work, the member falls off therapy, um, and I know that you know, some of the PBMs are now starting to come out with different kind of programs to try to limit um, the, uh, the employer's cost uh, for for, for particular specialty drugs, but uh, again, I, I think that, that that's only part of the equation. I think that there, it's, you know, a lot of those are, are probably what I call to be more given in terms of that they're not really giving up a whole lot in terms of some of the programs that they're offering. Um, but, I, but I think that, that part of it is, is really kind of thinking back and taking a step back as opposed to just paying, you know, in, in, in the past you know, 20 plus years, you know, or even longer than that, is, is just paying an AWP discount off of a drug without really having it tied to any kind of, uh, you know, quality uh, or any, um, you know, or tied to the, to the member or patient outcome. Um, and I think that, that in terms of outcome-based contracting, if you think about it, there really needs to be the involvement of, of really, you know, four different people or entities. One is really you, the employer or the payer, if you're paying for the cost of the drug, you need to be involved. Um, the, the, the physician needs to be involved as well, as well as the, the plant participant, and finally the PBM. Um, so kind of the four Ps. I mean, all there has to be uh, kind of a, everybody working together in terms of, particularly on these high cost uh, special drugs to make sure that they're actually, um, they're working. I think that the biggest challenge though, in terms of the outcome-based contracting is, is really demonstrating the value and how do you calculate that? And I think that that's, that's you know, from, from discussions I've had and from different things I've read, uh, I think that that's really the biggest challenge is, is how, do you, how do you establish what that value is, uh, the, the value that's being provided or not being provided? What, what, are, what is the source of the data or the metrics that you should use in determining whether that drug is, is actually, um, you know, working? Uh, and, and so part of that is, is really how do you, how do you get the PBM and your health plan and the physician and, and, and you and the, the, the plan participant working together and, and coordinating and looking at the, the medical side data, the pharmacy data to see, hey, is this drug working or not? Because if you think about it, if it's working, there's a good chance it's gonna lower your medical side costs. If it's not, then you probably don't wanna cover that drug for that particular, uh, for your population. But I think that, that uh, you know, having that data is really important and trying to work through that and, and when you're, if you really want to think about doing some kind of outcome-based contracting, it, it's establishing the, the basis for uh, if somebody misses it, what do they, what do they, what do they owe you? Um, and I think the part of it also is, is how long do you, you know, some of these drugs, if it's a cancer drug uh, or some of the other drugs that a member may be on, whether it be MS or rheumatoid arthritis, it, it's the length of time. How much time do you have to, to uh, uh, do you need to track the, the progress that a member is making on that particular drug? Um, as we all know, in today's market, you know, sometimes people don't stay in a job for more than a year or two. And, and you know, are you, if they go on to another employer or they change insurance companies or whatever that they decide to do, um, you know, is, you know is, does that work against you in terms of trying to get the data that's needed to establish that an outcome-based contract would actually be, would, would work for you? Um, but again, as I said, I, it's, it's, I think it's, it's possible to really kind of to look at your medical data and look at the, the pharmacy data to show, um, you know, whether it's actually working together. 
Um, and one of the things that, you know, that people have, have really looked at in terms of looking at different outcome-based contracting provisions is looking at, you know, is the drug that is, that's on that particular PBM's formulary, is it doing what it's saying it would do in the clinical trials when it was approved by the FDA? Um, that's one standard that, that you can possibly can consider because the FDA approved that particular drug based upon, you know, the clinical trials and the protocols that were established, and they approved the drug saying, oh, yep, it's going to do this. Well, what happens if it doesn't, if, it, if, if you, you tie the standard and all at once uh, those, uh, the, the population they used it on, you know, may work for that particular population for which it was approved, but it may not necessarily work for yours. So there's just different things that you can look at. Um, to determine whether or not that drug is actually working and, and, and kind of thinking outside the box and, and really kind of approaching uh, a PBM about, okay, fine, if, if a lot of times they wanted to give an ROI, return on investment, but it's very difficult to establish what that ROI is, but it's a lot easier if you can kind of tie, if you can, if you can take a step back and you can analyze as the employer the medical and pharmacy claims data that you have to see if that drug is working or not. I think that's probably something that you can do. And if it's not working, then it's negotiating something with your PBM in terms of either an additional discount or a rebate or something that you would get back if you decide to go ahead and use that particular drug. Now, there have been some drugs already out in the marketplace where some of the PBMs have, have actually negotiated some of these outcome-based pricing uh, arrangements in place. You know, as competition starts to come into market in, in the, the various therapeutic classes, right, there has been some issues where you know, they're getting some price guarantees, you know, rheumatoid arthritis or hepatitis C. You know, when you think about some of, some of the drug manuf or the PBMs on the hepatitis C side, they're going to say, you know, we'll cover up to $100,000 of cost, which is really basically, you know, three months of therapy for it. If it goes beyond that, right, there will be no additional cost. So they've kind of put in um, that, that outcomes-based contracting already with the drug manufacturers there or within the, you know, rheumatoid arthritis or, you know, or sometimes this – these new classes of drugs, which are called PCSK9s, which are these new injectable, um, especially biological drugs, used for lowering cholesterol, right? And they really should be just used for a very small number of people that have, um, you know, a specific disease or condition that, that would require them to have that. But gosh, if you start thinking about the, the contracts put around these things from a lot of people, you know, you can, you can get generic Lipitor type thing, and if you can take that orally, you know, for $500 a year type thing, where these PCSK9s could cost you as an employer up to $12,000 a year. It's a huge difference in cost in these things. So, you know, it's important to put some sort of controls around it. And most PBMs have put step therapies and controls around it. But Cigna's actually gone a little bit beyond that and said, you know, we want to put in some outcome-based requirements for this. It says, if you can show clinical trials that we get that bad cholesterol, that, that um, LDL, low-density lipoproteins, down below a certain level, right, then, you know, you can get deeper discounts for that. So you're actually proving that it works, that it's flowing through, that it's making sense, lowering that cholesterol level, achieving what you want, right, versus the, the older statin classes like generic Lipitor and stuff. So that's, that's kind of important to come through, right? That, you know, Express Scripts, like I said, has, has mentioned some other stuff. They also did one with um, this AstraZeneca drug called um, Uresa for, you know, coming through for lung cancer drugs. So does it work or not, you know, and what kind of you can get reimbursed if, it, if they approve it and it goes through but it's not, it doesn't work, or if the member stops, you know, the treatment before the third fill of this thing because they either can't handle the side effects or whatever, um, that they get their money back for that. So that's kind of a pretty valuable piece. And, you know, and Eli Lilly is another company that's kind of come through and does some rebate credits for a, a diabetic drug, um, Trulicity, right? If, it, if it's not outperforming and it's rival, it's not doing what it should be doing, with the A1C levels, the blood sugar levels in your system, and kind of showing how that is. So that's all these things. Are, there are these newer specialty drugs coming out there. The PBMs are reaching out and trying to negotiate some outcome-based contracting with that. And you, as the employer, should be taking advantage of that, right? Having that part in, of your agreement, being taking advantage of those kind of things flowing through so that you actually can either negotiate, you know, deeper pricing, better pricing for these things, or, you know, really get the outcomes you want. But you got to kind of do this whole cost versus benefit analysis, right? That's got to get done on this thing so you make sure that the cost as they flow through and the benefit that you're getting, that you truly are getting the outcome that you're paying for uh, by using these, these high-cost drugs. 
we, we have an, uh, a final question we wanted to put up on the board as it relates to um, outcome-based contracting. We're kind of curious about whether or not um, you would be willing, as an employer, as a payer, would you be willing to pay more for prescription drug if it guarantees a specified outcome? Um, <clears throat> if, you know, but right now, 80, almost 89%, 90%, yeah, you know, and, that, and that's, I think that's true. I think, well, 100%. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, because I, I think that, that, that that's, I think most um, plan sponsors feel that, hey, look, if, if this drug is going to cost X, I'm, I'm willing to pay for it if, it if it's going to be not necessarily a cure, but it's going to basically do what it says it's going to do, and if it will help me control the medical side costs that I have, I, I think it probably makes sense to, to pay, pay that additional cost, but it's also then building in the parameters from a contractual standpoint to make sure that if you're doing these things, or if it doesn't work, that there has to be some, some benefit to you um, so you're not bearing all the, the burden for, for that particular high cost, especially drug, or really it could be any, any high cost drug, brand drug that you, you have that, you're, you're, that may be on the PBM's formulary. So um, it's very interesting. It's a lot higher than I thought it would be. So um, we only have a couple of minutes. Um, I don't know if there are any questions, or Kelly, if you've received any questions, but I thought uh, we would open the floor to questions if anybody has any questions like they would like to ask us. I haven't seen any come through yet um, content related, but certainly there is another minute or two in case anyone does have one. Go ahead and type it in the question and answer pane at the bottom of your screen. While we're waiting to yeah, see if there's any, any questions, or I don't think uh, any. Questions. I don't think any questions we, have we come through. Okay. Yeah, we, we know this is a very complicated area, and and I, you know, we appreciate your time and and um, and listening. And um, if you have any questions, you can either send them to Kelly or send them to us, and we're more than happy to to answer them. But uh, you know, thank you for you know listening this afternoon. And thank you both for this excellent presentation. Um, and thank you for signing up to sponsor again with us in 2017. Uh, we're thrilled that you'll be back and at our 2017 programs to share your insights and information with our attendees. Uh, make plans to join us. And attendees, if you would, just complete a quick five-question uh, evaluation when we end this meeting. And we'll send out the slides and the recording tomorrow. And thanks again. Hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.